Great. All right. So, um, Michael, Raphael, I've got a couple gentlemen from IBM, um, Steve Visconti and Kevin Collins. Kevin's going to going to drive the, the demo of IBM Cloud and OpenShift and, and satellite and some other technologies within the IBM Cloud portfolio. So, uh, in in lieu of of wasting time of introductions, I'd like to just try to jump right in. I, I, I shared with the team a little bit of our previous conversation, Michael, so, so they're aware that you, you own Red Hat and that you're interested in OpenShift and containers and you have a little bit of CentOS left that you're migrating to Red Hat and, and your current, uh, and, and you leverage VMware as well. So um, with that, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll just jump into the meat of it. Yeah, sounds good. Great. All right. Um, my name is Steve Visconti, and I'll kind of do some setup, and then Kevin will do a demonstration. We support our uh, customers in the, in the Americas. Kevin and I, uh, we're above region resources at IBM, and our focus is on Red Hat OpenShift Kubernetes services on IBM's cloud and satellite. And you'll see kind of our, as our story goes through, I'll do some positioning on what we're calling the hybrid cloud platform and Kevin will show it to you. Um, it's a pretty simple uh, demonstration once you understand what is out there for you to make choices about, right? And this is a key part of our overall strategy. You know, when you say the word IBM to someone, they typically think of, oh, it's a mainframe company. You know, they've got this big service company where they you know, have a fairly amount of middleware, whether it's WebSphere or Tivoli or one of the 177 plus products that we have out in the market in our middleware stack. And where we're going under Harvard's leadership is building this fourth platform, which we're calling hybrid cloud, right? And what we've seen is that the analysts have pointed this point out. Uh, it's called the hybrid wall, where people look at, you know, their journey to the cloud and they have like a mixed environment, right? They have both on-prem and they have the cloud and they're finding it difficult to, you know, do the connectivity, connectivity and move uh, their workloads from on-prem to the cloud. And there's choices. There's gonna be a mixed vendor storyline. You may go to Microsoft with Office 365. You may decide to use an application like Salesforce and wind up with uh, Salesforce as, as a cloud provider. You could come to IBM, right? And, and we could provide OpenShift. And trying to navigate all these different infrastructure layers is not easy because none of it's done the same, right? And, you know, from an architecture point of view, somewhere about 20 to 25% of what was on-prem has moved to the cloud. Most of these applications were never designed for the cloud. They were monolithic applications, right? So um, people are not just doing a lift and shift of what they have on-prem to the cloud, they're trying to modernize to get the benefits of what the cloud was designed for from a hyperscale perspective, right? Uh, from performance and to drive cost out, right? Uh, because you can run, run less infrastructure under containers than you're typically gonna run from a, a, a virtual machine environment. And a data perspective, you know, it's proliferating at a rate um, that, you know, people can't even keep up with, right? And deriving the value from insight to this, people are struggling with. Uh, and when you add AI into the equation, you know, 51% of the people have said, yeah, this is a real challenge for us, right? Now, organizations have their peoples in process, right? Whether it's developers, operation people, security, data scientists, line of business, architects, right? They're trying to build standard automation and approaches across these silos of people that they're investing in. And, um, you know, it takes about a year and a half to build an application and about two years to actually build a new model to extract data. And this is the, you know, challenge people are being faced with that, you know, it's getting costly and actually more costly because the skills are in high demand around containers and, you know, developers um, there's a shortage of 1.4 million. 
And there's a lot of risk associated to go to the cloud related to compliance and regulatory systems, right? There were over 5 billion records compromised last year alone, right? So this is not, you know, a trivial process. This is what they describe as the hybrid wall. And I'll pause for a second to say, are these some of your concerns? And before I go into say, well, here's how we're going to solve the problem. Yeah, I, I'd say uh, somewhat. Yeah, like definitely security um, is, is a concern you know, moving into that environment. Okay, so security is definitely an open concern for you guys. Now, the workload you have today, are you going to do a lift and shift or are you trying to modernize those applications? Um, so, Rafael, I don't know if you want to chime in here but you know we're, we're we're you know researching it right now and okay in our, in our options there so the all right we don't really have this a plan in place right now we want to see what our options are and then you know start okay. using it you know start developing out in the cloud and you know get comfortable all right so as we kind of harness the open source technology uh, like Kubernetes, right? We're going to see people using Linux as a core piece of this story, regardless of the infrastructure they pick, right? So whether it's x86 all the way to the mainframe, right? Linux is going to be a common bond across these platforms. And RHEL happens to be one of number one Linux in the market, right? So uh, it will play a key role. OpenShift plays a key role from the point of containers. Two thirds of organizations already had made the decision that they're gonna migrate to containers. And the value of the container is they're gonna get better performance, okay? So if I can run more transactions per second in a container versus a virtual machine, then you know it, it's very attractive, but it also brings the hyperscale function to it, right? So when I'm want to use them, especially with COVID recently, people have really hit this, you know, digital transformation story. You know, I wanted to turn the systems down, not up, right? But I had invested so much on prem that, you know, and so much in the fixed cost model, I couldn't flex down, right? And, um, you know, COVID really emphasized this to a lot of organizations, made some co corporations bankrupt, right? Um, and our ability to use the cloud to scale not only up, but down, right? In whether it's an hourly, a monthly model, right? From a cost perspective, you know, where the demand comes, you know, is where we can, you know, add the service. So this becomes a big part of why containers are so important. You may now build on-prem for the minimum, right? And then, you know, build in the cloud to support the maximum, right? Uh, and that is what containers can do with the cloud in a hybrid model. And Kevin will kind of show this as you build the storyline, uh, both on-prem and in the cloud at IBM, right? And our cloud story go be goes beyond IBM, right? We're going to talk about how containers and our managed instances of them could be extended back on-prem, but also other cloud providers or even edge devices, you know, for remote location, where a service sits or, you know, depending on the industry you're working in, you know, it's going to vary uh, cell power for telco or, uh, you know, an ATM machine for banking, et cetera, right? Um, and then people have the ability to change the process around where the way they've been going to market with this DevOps security dialogue, right? So they're going to move to more of these agile processes where microservices are going to play a key role. And the orchestration between these microservices and the containers become critical. And you'll see that OpenShift has built within it in their 4.4 release, something called the service nest, which is built on Istios and open standard that allows you to coordinate the containers with those microservices. And the same is true with the, the, the data side of the story here, right? having governance in AI, right? And IBM in our cloud, you'll see we bring those services together. And we're building all this in, in this concept of these cloud packs and driving insight and software through 
you know, those business drivers, right, is the key to the, to the whole thing. Not for technology's sake, but for business sake. And at the end of the day, our process changes and the technology is going to accelerate your time to market from what used to take years down to months to build these applications. And you're going to run it, run it on four times less infrastructure. So that becomes a cost equation, right? And you'll see that we have certain things in the market around encryption and compliancy and regulatory processes that the federal government may have for you, right? Where our cloud will help deliver reducing the risk and bringing standard standards about the way you go to market with containers, regardless of where you go to market with containers, right? And you'll hear how satellite can help you do that. Um, and we looked at our customers who were, you know, in this cloud journey about, you know, uh, many of them are, have done the lift and shift. They've taken the VMware, they've, you know, moved it to the cloud and they've got about a one X return, right? Now, where we see a greater return is that as people go through this transformation of modernizing the applications with containers, you know, they're going to get greater value. So, for example, Coca-Cola, their bottling company, they worked with IBM to containerize and change their DevOps processes, right, and bring automation together, right? And they've gotten, you know, a greater return. Now, another customer of ours, WPP, the world's largest media publishing company, they don't dictate where the client wants to run it, right? So they have to build a skill set to run wherever the client tells them. Oh, we want to run on Azure, we want to run on Google, we want to run on IBM, right? And that's become very costly for them. So they went to IBM and they used our distributed cloud model where they learned how to deploy the applications that they want to deploy for their clients in a single way, wherever they want to run it. And that derives the greatest value of that investment they're making at two and a half times, right? So this is a big part of what we're doing in the cloud that's different than what you'll go to Azure or Google or whoever, whoever else, is that we're building a hybrid strategy, not just a cloud strategy. Now, it boils down to these five things. Business acceleration, developer productivity, infrastructure, compliancy, and risk, and optionality. And we'll focus on these five things to drive the cost down, right? The speed of the developer, being more productive as a developer, reducing the infrastructure, and reducing the risk and giving you the choice of where you want to run that workload, right? Hey, Steve. Yes. Are, are you do you are you displaying anything? Because I don't see anything. I don't know if you think you're displaying or not. Really, I thought I was. Well, it sounds great <laughs> for sure, uh, but it would definitely be easier to look at something too. Oh um, yeah, I, I totally apologize. I thought I was sharing. So now let me try this again. You see something now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I apologize. I didn't think, I oh, thought you okay. were just chatting. I, I was then... presenting a whole story. So let me kind of just <laughs> so you get the imagery of what I was telling you. I was taking you through the story of the hybrid platform wall. Then I took you through the open source foundation slide. Okay. And then this conversation of grading greater value through a hybrid model. Okay. And this is where I was telling the story of these five you know, value points. So I'm going to jump into Kubernetes now. Right. So what we've seen in the market is that, you know, Kubernetes can be hard to do, right? It's, it's not necessarily simple. It requires, you know, a good set of skills and that 75% of, you know, organizations have told us that the top blocker to adoption is the complexity of the implementation for not just installing it, but to deploy it and harden it and to have the operational model around it for upgrades and patches. And what happens is in innovation is happening so fast. I mentioned Istio's earlier, where you know in 4.4 in 4.0 we had operators, then 4.4 we had Istio's, and now Knative is coming, and Kubevert for virtualization in a single control plane. Right, every version has new value to it. With you know you know trying to keep up with this has become really difficult for customers. Right. 
And, you know, this is why the customer has to ultimately navigate this ecosystem. So who are they going to pick for their cloud provider, their provisioning tools, their runtimes, their orchestration management, right? App development, et cetera, right? These are all the choices you have to make. And when you go with standards Kubernetes, it's not prescriptive. It's not opinionated like Red Hat is, right? And OpenShift has become kind of used as the, the market leader here because it's executed well and it has an opinionated approach around these choices you're gonna make, right? Uh, for automation, you'll use Ansible, right? Um, these are the, the, the tools that they have within their strategy. It's kind of more of an opinionated approach then some people just want to use Kubernetes for its flexibility of, of lots of different choices. The problem is you got to find the skills, right? And finding somebody that can, can navigate all the choices, sometimes more choice can be not a good thing, right? And, you know, some people want that, but other people don't. The other choice that you're going to have to make is you're going to have to decide, how am I going to go to market? Am I going to do this myself, right? Do I want to go with a combination approach where, IBM provides a managed service or Azure or, or Red Hat, right? Um, or do I want to, you know, go with a, I don't want anything to do with this, just give it to a service provider. And then I'm going to run Kubernetes, I'm going to run the application as well, right? And a business partner can, you know, do that uh, on our platform. So um, when we went to market, we made the choice to pick that middle column, right? We, we went with a managed instance. So what does it mean, right? It means that we give you these three things. First of all, it has automated provisioning. So when you wanna build this container, right? To provision it is dead simple. We have this great user experience award-winning and you'll see Kevin show this to you. And it's like a 98% productivity for an end user to actually deploy a container, right? Uh, versus trying to do it through the command line interface and the instruction set, right? So we also do the upgrades, the patches, the scaling performance hyperscale function. And it comes with a site reliability engineering team that provides these type of services. And we'll talk about the services in a second, right? But we didn't stop there. We made this so that it's production ready for you. So when Kevin goes into the demo, he's going to make some choices, right? I'm going to build an HA three node, you know, multi-zone deployment of the technology. So when we build it, it's production ready right out of the gate, right? And then you'll see that this, our platform is integrated, meaning things that you're gonna need to run the workload, like your authorization authentication functions, your logging and monitoring functions, your vulnerability security functions, your pipeline development processes, right? You'll see these things are integrated into our platform. And he'll show you this in the demo. Now, this comes with a compliant environment. So out of the box, it's PCI, HIPAA, GDPR, SOX 1-2 uh, compliant, right? And we're running massive workloads on this thing, like American Airlines, you know, the ticket rerouting process occurs on our platform. The weather.com. So if, you know, weather hits, you know, we get about 14 billion API calls from a scale perspective you know, a day. And, you know, when weather hits, that's when people go to, you know, check it out. We have to scale it up. When the event's over, we scale it down, right? Um, this is all part of the value proposition that we put in the cloud. So I said, the, what are the services we provide? This is the exact services. So we do the provisioning, the installation and configuration, the upgrade, the patch management. We do failover recovery. We do scaling, backup. We've integrated the platform, as I mentioned. We have all the networking function as part of it. Um, you'll see that there's a security process of image deployment and enforcement of hardware. Um, mentioned the site reliability engineering team, uh, the compliance points, and the multi-zone. Uh, and, and we've fine-tuned this you know, so that it's secure and hardened. Down to the level of a security perspective, you'll hear us talk about encryption and FIPS 142 level four security. Well, uh, what does that mean, right? It means that the data, whether it's in rest or motion is gonna be encrypted. We actually are the only vendor in the cloud that can encrypt it into a, a hypercrypto protection appliance in a mainframe, okay? So 
Uh, and you'll see the simplicity. If you want this level of security, you know, it's basically a checkoff box and Kevin will show you how we do this. These, these are things that if you go to another cloud provider or you try to build this yourself, these are manual processes that take weeks, sometimes months to do, right? When you do logging and monitoring, it can take you months to build that, right? And we do it in like 15 seconds. Now. Yeah, can I stop you there? Can sure. someone, Andreas, in from the lobby? I think he's in the lobby right now. Yeah, I just let him in. I just saw him. Oh, thank you. Yep. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you would make the decision, I'm going to do this myself. You're going to have to do, get the skills and do all these things. Or I'm going to go to a managed provider like IBM. And you'll do the top two things and we'll do the rest, right? So we wanted to quantify this for our clients. We wanted to be, say, you know, if we were building a nine by three node cluster, you know, what would it cost to do it yourself from a hardware perspective, a facility, software, even training we put in it, right? FTE costs and then the total. And you can get a feel of, wow, you know, I can save a lot of money here by using a managed instance, right? And then we abstracted this out into years two and three for those kind of environments. We broke literally the numbers down and it's roughly about a 70% savings that we're deriving in this managed instance when you really look at the total cost of ownership. Now, when you go to look at a cloud provider and you decide, oh yeah, we're interested in this application modernization or we're gonna do a, a data center exit and a digital transformation of our company or we're gonna build cloud native applications. You're going to pick, uh, you know, a container strategy, and that strategy, you know, if you come to IBM, you can get just regular old Kubernetes, right? So um, we have a managed instance that I was talking about for Kubernetes as well, right? But what OpenShift derives is it brings this opinionated approach and brings additional services like the platform services, the application services, and the developer services. Right. So before I was talking about Istios and the service mass or Knative function, or you'll see the logging and monitoring. Right. These are platform type services. Application services are the ability to, you know, have the optional run times you want to run. Right. Integration to cloud packs. Um, you know, those type of services you'll see from our solution. And then developer services allow you to have, you know, code ready workstations and flexibility of IDE that you want to choose. The last piece of it is great. That's within IBM's cloud, but we want to run somewhere else back on prem, right? Or another cloud provider. You're going to see satellite, which we recently in introduced when Kevin does his demonstration, he's going to show you, you can pick bare metal, you can pick virtual servers, or you can even pick a server outside of IBM's cloud. And that managed value proposition and the additional services that come from the IBM catalog there's 190 plus services. So let's say you wanted artificial intelligence or a cloud pack, right? Um, you can take those services and then deploy them outside our organization where you want to run it, okay? And that's where it's satellite is changed the game for us. Now, we talked about market leadership and Forrester, right? Red Hat is, is and IBM is about as far right hand you're going to get, right? From, from the container point of view. And, you know, this was invented by Google. So they get a 4.235, you know, we're getting a 4.35. I love this slide because it doesn't just say we're the leader. It talks about strategy and market presence, kind of defining as ability to execute, right? And we're getting a five in every category, right? There isn't another choice in the marketplace that has that capability, right? I don't even care if you pick Rancher or Google. Rancher is supposed to be simpler and Google's, you know, invented the technology. Nobody has done it like OpenShift. And it, you see this, that's why people are coming here. And the business case has been validated through the analysts on the return on investment for OpenShift and some of the key points I was making, like the provisioning time being improved, the operational efficiencies or reduction of FTEs and hours that people have to put into it, right? Um, great stories by these analysts of, you know, quick payback in months of the investment people are making. You'll hear the story of Satellite. He'll show you a little bit about a cloud pack being deployed today, right? It could be any workload. Um, and it really allows us to extend what we've done in our platform to where you decide to run it, right? And, um, you know, key things that we're helping with, these may be some concerns you may have, 
is security across the locations that you deploy, having standard processes, data latency. So uh, sometimes there's governance requirements or data residency requirements, right? Satellite can help in those areas. Visibility, you'll see when he goes into the control plane of our cloud, you'll see the other servers. So when he makes a change or he updates, right? It changes everywhere, right? That compliancy, the security, the encryption, all consistent, the skill set being consistent, right, um, is one of the value propositions of what we've done. So that's the setup. And I know I, I covered a lot and I apologize for not sharing the screen, um, but we'll send the deck along too. So you have the slides. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to show it to you. All right. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to share my screen. Um, not sure if you have to stop. I did. No. Okay. Which one is it? All right. So before I start, can everyone see my screen here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, yeah. This won't be a good demo unless you actually see what I'm uh, doing here. So what I do is, is build off what Steve talked about and actually show you uh, IBM Cloud. We'll build a cluster. We'll put some more code on it. Then we'll get into some day two uh, operations. So when you, you start by IBM Cloud, you go to cloud, IBM.com, and you get this dashboard. And I can see, you know, if I scroll down the resources I have, any maintenance issues, status of the cloud, uh, things like that. Um, so first thing we're going to do is create a cluster. And there's several ways you can create uh, a cluster. You can use this call portal. You can use the command line, a CLI. You could do API calls. You could use uh, Terraform, IBM Cloud Schematics. You, cho choice is yours. Probably the easiest way to understand what's happening is the catalog. So I click on this, the uh, catalog here. And this is like Steve said, this is where you go to deploy any of the 190 uh, plus services we have in, in uh, IBM Cloud. So um, when I'm in the catalog, I can search for OpenShift. Um, actually, I have the tile here. I'll just click on that. Um, this launches me into the UI to actually install an instance of manage OpenShift on, on IBM Cloud. So first thing I need to do is indicate what version of OpenShift do I want. Uh, you can see right now the default version is 4.6. I could select 4.5 if I wanted. Um, we're typically, you, you know, since this is a managed service, we're guaranteeing, you know, the 4.9s uh, SLA. We're about 90 day. We support um, OpenShift 90 days after uh, Red Hat officially releases it. So 4.7 will be coming uh, shortly. Um, so right now we are at uh, 4.6, and I'll scroll down. Next thing you need to do is either uh, provide a license for uh, OpenShift container platform through a cloud pack I may bought, or I'll need to buy a license. Now, all of our cloud packs, um, they only run on OpenShift, and they include an OpenShift license on uh, IBM Cloud. Again, this is another one of the key differentiators, I would say, with cloud packs running on IBM Cloud, is we make it just incredibly easy to provide your own uh, OpenShift license through a cloud pack. If you look on the right, when I select apply my OCP entitlement, this price is going to go down significantly as I'm applying that license to my, um, to, to my uh, cluster here. As I scroll down, you can see I have three choices of infrastructure. Uh, we have classic infrastructure, virtual private cloud, or satellite location. With the classic infrastructure, you indicate where do you want to deploy the cluster to. If I scroll down a little bit, I have my screen pulling up so you, you can see it. But so you indicate where do you want to deploy the uh, cluster to. By default, we're going to recommend a multi-zone region to achieve you know, the four nines SLA I talked about. If you wanted to, maybe for a dev system, you could select a single zone region and then from a number of different um, data centers. You can select single zone and number of data centers. Multi-zone, you'd select one of our multi-zone regions, which are Washington or uh, 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 Dallas, you can see there. If I scroll down a little bit, um, let's go back to this uh, single zone. I'll go to like Dallas. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the nice things you'll see is it's going to populate all the networking for me on uh, on my behalf. It, it's going to create you know VLANs for me if they don't exist. If I select one that already has VLANs uh, created, it's going to select them for me automatically. Again, part of, uh, of a managed service, it's nice. Don't worry about all the networking uh, stuff. 
In this demo, I'm going to create a, a VPC uh, cluster, but I want to show you a satellite that Steve talked about a little bit. So I click on satellite. This is another option we have. Uh, I've even called satellite, or you are able to deploy services like Manage OpenShift on by IBM Cloud onto your location. That could be on-prem, could be another cloud provider. Uh, it could be uh, at the edge to get, give you just uh, a few options there. Uh, you can view satellite location as a mini IBM cloud region. So this runs on infrastructure that you provide. You provide the infrastructure, you register with IBM cloud satellite, then we can install our services like OpenShift on top of that. So when I select satellite, instead of seeing those IBM uh, data centers like Dallas 10, Dallas 12, you get a list of satellite locations. Um, you can see I have a number of different locations I have already set up. So if I wanted to deploy to location, again, infrastructure that you have provided, I'd select that location and then uh, uh, go through the, uh, the, the same workflow. So here I am going to go to uh, VPC, show you what that uh, looks like, where you have more choice of, of infrastructure that you can uh, provide. Um, so when I click on VPC, First thing I need to do is indicate which virtual private cloud do I want to uh, deploy the cluster to. Uh, you can say I have one here, it's called ICH. Um, and then I need to either create or, uh, or select a cloud object storage instance. Now this will be used to store and back up the internal registry of OpenShift. Again, as part of the managed service, we're going to automatically back up your image registry. You just indicate which instance of IBM object storage you want to use, and the service takes care of the rest. And just note, we're also going to back up your cluster configuration. Um, so uh, the service, it's going to automatically back up your etcd, encrypt it, and store that in a, in a IBM cloud-owned object storage as well. So scrolling down, I can see a resource group. Um, resource group, you can view this as a way of segregating your um, uh, resources. So if you have different applications or environments like production or dev, you can um, use resource groups to group uh, a bunch of resources together. It could be like a cloud database and a cluster and maybe a DevOps process as an example. All right, uh, then scrolling down, um, there's the concept of uh, worker zones. Uh, again, this is going to be populated automatically for me from, from my v VPC. So my VPC has three zones, a multi-zone VPC, uh, you know, going across Washington, D.C., one, two, and three. And I already have some that's created for me, so that's going to be selected for me uh, automatically. Again, it's nice. I don't have to, you know, uh, it, it just populates that for me. I don't have to set that up in my cluster. It's going to recognize for my VPC all the networking I have in place. And then I'll deploy the cluster using that. One quick note uh, about um, high availability. So every cluster we deploy, we deploy with HA masters. So that means three or more. And we deploy these masters in an IBM account. Um, that's how we manage scalability, upgrades, availability, and operational side of the master. So the control plane side, that's taken care of by IBM. And that is, I would say, one of the key parts of, of what you get with a managed service. We're going to handle that, um, the control plane, the master nodes for you automatically. So with this uh, multi-zone cluster, again, the default that's uh, selected in the specified geography, and here it's Washington, D.C., I'm deploying the masters and workers across three zones. So three physically separated data, center, uh, data centers, you know, building in operational excellence into that cluster. So you can focus on building your app, your application and solving your business objectives. So you're not building and managing resiliency into your cluster. We're gonna do that for you automatically. So I'm gonna keep those three uh, selected by the default. Then I scroll down, uh, you'll see here something called a uh, default worker pool. So a worker pool is a grouping of worker nodes that are same flavor or t-shirt size for workers in, the, uh, in that pool. So worker node pools allow us to do things like auto scaling. So when the deployed uh, worker nodes reach capacity, we can't schedule any more workload to the nodes. We can have additional you know, nodes of the same flavor can be added automatically with auto scaling. Again, fully customizable minimums and maximums. Another use case we're seeing more and more our clients are creating worker pools just with, um, you know, it could be bare metal worker nodes with uh, GPUs, you know, very uh, kind of, um, you know, high performing and also, you know, expensive worker nodes. So you don't want to put, 
uh, you know, um, uh, workloads that don't that, that don't leverage GPUs, you don't want them to use those uh, worker pools. So we can uh, label and tank the nodes. So you're using uh, the uh, infrastructure most uh, effectively. All right. Uh, so by default, we're good. The default setting is four uh, by sixteen. So four CPU, sixteen gigs of memory, and uh, three worker nodes per zone. Fully customizable. If you want to change the flavor, uh, you know Steve talked about where you can select from uh, worker nodes with uh, GPUs as as an example. You can filter on small, medium, large, or you can select individual uh, worker nodes yourself. Um, I'm installing CloudPack for data. And that likes uh, 16 by 64 worker nodes. So I'll just select that and click uh, save. And I'm going to create two worker nodes per zone. And then you can give it a name. I just typically leave the name as, uh, as uh, default. Um, next, I can select pu public or private endpoints. So if your application you know, is, not on the is not internet facing, right? Uh, you may want to consider a private only uh, like air gapped uh, type cluster. I'm gonna use, just keep the private and public uh, selected. And then you give your uh, uh, cluster a, a name. I'll just leave the defaults. And when you're ready, you just click create and now go ahead and create the cluster uh, for me. So you, you see this screen's gonna change in a minute showing me it's preparing the um, master and, and worker nodes for me. Um, but what's happening on the back end, the first thing we're gonna do is deploy all the master nodes. Once etcd reaches quorum, you know, with those, that highly available configuration I selected, we'll start provisioning the worker nodes inside that cluster. You can see it, it's building there. Now this isn't really that exciting to watch. I mean, you can you can see the worker nodes per, progress, uh, but it does take about 20 minutes or so for this cluster to be created. Um, so I'm going to jump back up to something that already exists and dig into that what that looks like. But I want to pause for a minute, see if there are any questions about provisioning the the cluster, or I can skip ahead to day two operations. No, it's a nice, nice interface. It seems pretty, uh, you know, user friendly. <laughs> it seems pretty straightforward. You know, it's going through. Yeah, a lot, lot of work was done to uh, to uh, streamline this. Um, yeah, and I, I use this um, to, to build clusters all the time, so I'm, it, it is a nice tool to to use. Um, so you can see, you know, so you know, real, real quick, if I could jump in here too, please, just, please, please. just to pile on a little bit more from our, our previous conversation that we had with, with you folks is, you know, if you were to, to deploy this on site, you know, you're going to have to read the manual. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. I mean, you know, OpenShift isn't rocket scientist, but rocket science, but it's close, right? And you don't have to do any of that with this. It's really great, including upgrades, which is really important. So I, I just want to hammer that, that point in again. So. Yeah, thanks. And do you have a, a, any interest in cloud packs or uh, I can go two routes here. I can focus more on day two operations or show the, how easy we, it is to install a cloud packs. We didn't really talk to them about cloud packs. Maybe you could give them a really high level idea of what it might be. And um, yeah, so, uh, so, so I'll go back to the catalog and my search for a cloud pack. So a cloud packs you can view as a, a basically a collection of, of software and there are different categories. There's one for applications, business automation, uh, data and integration and multi-cloud management and security. Um, more and more are uh, popping up and they're reorganizing, consolidating them. And it's basically a collection of, of software. Probably the most popular one I'd say is Cloud Pack for Data. And Cloud Pack for Data um, uh, has tools for you know data visualization, all of our Watson tools, um, th things like that. So when you want to go ahead and install a Cloud Pack, um, if you do to do this manually, this is something that takes um, weeks and weeks to do. We're hearing uh, from from uh, our clients and from the field if you to do this manually. Um, we have simplified this. You'll see how easy we've made it. Um, you search for all packed for data, excuse me, in the uh, catalog. You scroll down. You you indicate what clusters that one cluster that's building that we just kicked off. 
you indicate which cluster do you want to install this file pack on. Again, you could um, select from a satellite cluster, you could select um, a VPC cluster, classic cluster, it, it doesn't matter. Um, this is one I created just right before this meeting, so 9.51, just you know, less than an hour ago. Um, it, it's ready, ready to go. I then scroll down, I select which uh, Kubernetes namespace or OpenShift project I want to install that in. I run a pre-installation script. This is going to set the security context constraints for me and uh, basically configure the cluster so it allows me to actually install the call pack. I scroll down, uh, I select what storage do I want to use. Uh, I can select from file storage or a port work software defined storage that we have. And then I go, scroll down here and this is where you indicate what parts of the cloud pack do you want to install. So what software components, um, you know, we have Watson uh, OpenScale, we have Analytics Dashboard, DB2 Warehouse, Data Virtualization, Watson Studio, you, you get the idea. Probably most common are Watson Knowledge Catalog, Data Visualization, uh, most common. You just click that you read the agreement, click install, that's it. Um, so something that takes you know seconds to do again if you do this manually it, it's a rather complex uh, process um, this takes probably more uh, i'd say like two hours or so to install the cloud pack it, it's uh, installing the cloud pack using uh, terraform but this is the type of automation that we've created you know to uh, make our platform easy to to work with um, so while that's creating i'm going to go out, jump back to the list of other clusters I already have that have already been created. Um, actually, I can go into this one that we're installing the, the cloud pack on. So you can go into this. Actually, I'm going to switch. Sorry. I'm going to switch to, uh, let's see. I'm going to switch to this cluster to show you something. Um, so uh, when, when you launch into your cluster overview page, you know, you get your ID. This ID what is what you would use if you had to get support from IBM. You can see the version of this. This is the version of the uh, cluster itself. Where is it running? What zones? When was it created? Your ingress subdomain and some other things. Uh, the important part, again, as a managed service, we're going to keep this subversion. You can see at 37.15.36. That's the very latest release from Red Hat. It has the latest you know, security and patch levels for version 4.5. We're going to keep um, that subversion updated for you automatically on, on your master nodes. Again, part of the service. If you, you know, wanted to use some of the latest and greatest features of 4.6, maybe something with uh, Knative or container native virtualization, you need to update that to 4.6. To do so, you go to Actions update version. What version do you want to update to? 4.6, click update, come back in an hour, and then do the same on the uh, worker nodes. If I click on worker nodes, you can see my worker nodes are uh, slightly back level version. They, they don't have the latest uh, patch level. And the reason for this, it's the customer's responsibility for updating the worker nodes. And the reason for that is to when you update a worker node, you actually take that worker node offline for a period of time. Now, if I had selected all of these worker nodes and click update, it's going to go through one by one and update the worker nodes. When the first one's done, I'll go do the second one, then the third, then the fourth, right? Uh, but you will, you, you will have those worker nodes will go offline, you know, one by one, which could affect your uh, uh, workload. So you have a couple options. You can expand your worker pool to handle the, the case of losing a worker node. Um, but you know, we typically you would just do this in uh, uh, off peak time and um, oops, it's gonna pop up. And, and you would be fine because it would uh, roll through them uh, one by one. But the same process, you just click update and that'll update the worker nodes to the version of the master for you uh, automatically. Other thing I want to show quickly, again, going back to this uh, cluster. So this is a cluster I just created today. I haven't done anything like enabling logging, monitoring, encryption, or anything on, on this cluster uh, yet. And you can see, you know, scrolling down, I can see there's a section again for logging, monitoring, key management, and image security enforcement. So if I want to turn on any of these features, I want to turn on logging as an example, click connect then you uh, indicate what instance of logging do you want to connect the cluster to. I can select that one, click connect. 
And this will install, you know, a very lightweight agent um, onto my cluster for me automatically. You'll see the screen's going to go away and that connect button will switch to launch. Um, in just a second here. So yeah, so and, and at that point, that agent has been installed onto my uh, cluster. So then if I want to go into the logging view of that cluster, I would click launch. Oh, I just did this a few seconds ago, so there's not going to be many uh, logs yet, but the, the logs will start uh, uh, flowing. Um, the, the nice thing here is that this logging view shows me a lot. Um, you can see logs are starting to flow already. So this shows me logs for all of the clusters I have connected to that logging instance. So it's a single pane of glass to view the logs for all my clusters. So I click on this filter here. I can go to uh, you know another cluster I have, click apply. Now I'm viewing the logs for that cluster. I could select multiple clusters if I want. And then under you know, sources and apps, I can select different microservices I have to really uh, narrow down. We we'll probably do a whole session on just how great this logging tool is. I, I'm a big uh, fan of it. And then same with uh, monitoring uh, and key management. So if you want to enable key management, um, you'd click enable. And like Steve was talking about, we have two choices. One is uh, Key protect, um, which is basically bring your own key, and the other one is um, hyper protect crypto services, which is um, keep your own key. And like Steve said, that's the FIPS 140-2 level four um, encryption. So this gives you technical assurance that IBM cannot uh, have any access to your encryption keys. You own that. We have no visibility into that. You know, every cloud provider has the concept of bring your own key which provides you operational insurance that we're not gonna you know, look at your data. But with keep your own key, it's technical assurance. We have no way of getting access to, the, to your key or the data. So if you lose this key, you know, warning here, um, you own the key, we can't retrieve it for you. So if you lose the key, we actually have to physically replace all the hardware. That's the you know, type of encryption we think of you know, regulated workloads that our uh, clients are, are choosing. So you would select basically what instance you want to connect and then, uh, oops, went too fast. And then what is your root key? Click enable and then your um, cluster would be uh, enabled. Um, again, that's another thing. It just takes a matter of uh, seconds. So if I switch back to another cluster I have really quick uh, here, uh, you can see I've enabled, um, I've not, uh, wrong cluster, sorry. Um, I'm gonna go back to this one. Sorry about that. Uh, I've enabled uh, both uh, you know, key management, uh, logging, and monitoring. So monitoring, same thing. Click on launch. Takes me in context to logging for this specific uh, cluster, and I can view you know very granular levels of, of detail for anything in my cluster I want to uh, monitor. And I have also access to. Um, a monitoring view for all my clusters to get a single pane of glass. You know, by default, you're going to get these uh, Kubernetes golden signals to see how uh, my cluster is performing. If I go to overview tab, I can view, view information about um, all the clusters I have, what, uh, how are the nodes performing. Um, you got to get the idea. Uh, again, we could have a whole other session, just uh, a prior hour long session, just on uh, log DNA. I mean, uh, cystic, I'm uh, monitoring the, the cystic. Is so, this, is this Grafana or um, Prometheus? It, it's cystic. Oh, okay. And last thing I'm going to quickly show, I know I have a few minutes left while I um, pause for some questions after, after this. Um, we, uh, if you go to the DevOps tab, um, this shows me again another type of integration we have on the platform. So this shows me all the tool chains I have for this uh, running on this cluster. And the nice thing is I don't have to go into the cluster right, to view the status of my uh, tool chains. I can just uh, click on the DevOps tab that shows me all the tool chains onto that cluster. And then I can dive into it um, to, to see uh, the details of that tool chain. Again, being a fully integrated platform, I have that integrated with my uh, encryption service, my key protect uh, encryption service. And I can see delivery pipelines for each microservice I have. And I've also created something called a delivery pipeline private worker. And what this is doing, it's building my uh, Docker images 
inside my cluster. So my data never leaves the, the cluster and it's encrypted the, the whole time. So again, when you think of like an integrated platform with encryption and security, that's the type of thing that you, we, we have um, with cloud, with IBM Cloud, and it makes it really easy to see what's happening by, um, again, going into that cluster view, going into uh, DevOps. So <laughs> if only a few minutes left, any questions, anything else I can uh, show you? Yeah, this is a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is just a quick, a quick overview. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I see a lot of, um, you know, um, automation in, in, in it, which is really good. Um, saves a lot of time. Uh, I myself, um, been working on containers and and Kubernetes, you know, doing that manually is a lot. Um, uh, I believe that OpenShift is uh, is a game changer in this in this area. So, yeah, and last thing I'll show. So you have also access to the OpenShift console. So if you just click that. This will take me again to the console, and you have full cluster admin. Uh, privileges. So it's the same console, OpenShift console that we all probably know and love and makes it really easy to work with OpenShift. Yep. So um, the thing is in, in, uh, in our company right now, um, we do have very limited number of applications that are being managed uh, as per, um, you know, um, as per container um, operated applications. So um, that, is, that is a future that we're looking at. Um, we don't actually do have in a situation where we have to manage a workload uh, of, a, of a large con uh, applications that we have them broken down into microservices because actually we are a uh, network provider, uh, mostly service provider company that we uh, we run a few different um, applications that manages the underlying uh, systems in in the networks and, and stuff like DNS and and um, and, and EFAX and so um, most of our stuff are not. Uh, DevOps related, but uh, I've been working with some some other applications that I'm trying to automate their processes, uh, which I believe in the future we're coming on in this in this space. It will be a very good thing for us to have to automate stuff around without doing any manual work in it. So this is really good presentation. Um, I really appreciate all the, um, you know, showing us all around. I, I used to hear about IBM Cloud, you know much about this, <laughs> but it's, it's great. I, I really appreciate that. I don't know, um, Andres, you were trying to say something? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think this looks great. Um... And as Raphael was saying, like, you know, uh, one of our challenges is that we, we don't have huge workloads that we're pushing through every day. You know, we're providing like a, like a breadth of services uh, and, and none of them are at, at very large scale, right? Um, but so uh, with OpenShift is... I don't know if I missed it. Is this like on-prem and cloud, like for hybrid setups? Yeah, so when, when he was talking about creating the satellite location, that would be on-prem. We The concept of satellite is you establish a link and a location. So that server was your hardware somewhere, let's say back on in your data center, right? Right. We're now taking our managed capabilities the way he deployed on that virtual server, he could deploy it back on your data center. Right. You do the upgrade, it upgrades everywhere. Nobody's doing what we're doing here. <clears throat> yeah, that sounds nice. 
So that will be through an API API call from the from this from the IBM Cloud platform to the data center or is it direct connect? So it could be through a VPN. It could be through a direct connection. It it depends how you configure it. Yeah, there's something called. Why don't you talk about links for a second? Yeah, so there's something called satellite uh, link. Uh, let me go here. Uh, so satellite link. Let me go to my list of satellite locations. I'll go this location six. Set that up. Uh, today, there's this concept of satellite link. So satellite link is what's going to, uh, it's basically a TL, TLS tunnel from your uh, location, your on-prem or another cloud provider to IBM cloud. I go to link endpoints. You can see it has, this has a zero trust model. So none of your data is going to be set to IBM cloud. Link is used for sending logging and metric data. Then also our cloud SREs will use this to make sure the service is up and running. This is something you have complete control over. So I've created a cluster onto this satellite location. You can see there's some links created, link endpoints created for me automatically. There's some for IAM to manage authentication. There's logging, monitoring, cloud object storage for backing up. Another uh, monitoring one, health check, making sure the cluster is uh, healthy than the API uh, itself. If you want to disable any of these, you certainly can. You just click uh, that toggle button you can uh, you know, uh, toggle it on and off. And then also, um, is if you use the, our uh, logging uh, service, all of the, the data being sent is audited. So you have audit uh, uh, capabilities to view exactly what's being sent to, to IBM Cloud. But this link is what basically establishes that connection between your location and IBM Cloud. And that can run on, uh, like Steve was saying, uh, a VPN or, um, uh, direct link, anything like that. So this link is basically a secure TLS encrypted tunnel. Great, great. Well, um... <laughs> our view of the world is satellite. Think of it as looking up in the sky and everybody's putting satellites out there. Now what you're doing is creating mini IBM clouds everywhere, right? And our value prop is what we put in our cloud is now extensible. So you want that Watson service, you want that cloud pack, you want any of the services. And we have a roadmap to all the services coming. Every service we built in IBM cloud is built on Kubernetes. So Steve, I apologize. I, I do have an 11 o'clock. Yeah, no, we're, we're at the end. So uh, okay. you know, we'll get you the deck. You know, you guys want to try it. We do have some programs. We have this move to Kube program where you get three months. We put a credit out on the account. You can go play on it. Um, you know, oh, great. great. You know, that might be the best back. next step, really. More, more important, you know, we have uh, a garage initiatives where we'll sit down with you, discuss your, your workloads, you know, identify maybe which ones you want to, you know, move to the cloud or containerize, right? And then we can move to an MVP POC type of thing in the garage environment. So, but you know, those are options. We can talk about those in the next steps, um, but we'll work through, you know, the partner here. Um, is there a, like a TCO tool? Like you can figure out costs on that? Yeah, so all the costs are in the catalog. Uh, if you go the to catalog. IBM, okay. right? And the cost of the product uh, varies. Uh, there is a, a pay-go model where you just pay and use it, right? There's a pay-go commit model where it's more of, you know, I'm signing an annual contract and, uh, you know, I may use less in the beginning, but as I scale up, I'll use more. And then you true up yeah. at the end of the year, that's the, called the Pago commit. And then there's a commit model. So we have a uh, monthly pricing, uh, we have uh, annual pricing and a three year uh, reserved instance price. So the annual and the, the three year, meaning when you get to always on and you're running a workload, uh, you know, the commit models give a little greater discount so you go from hourly to monthly to annual to multi-year, the discounts go up and up and up and up. Okay. okay. All right. No, I appreciate it. We'll take a look. You know, I look forward to seeing that. that deck. There were some nice slides in there. I'd like to see. Yeah, we'll get you the deck. We'll put a PDF to, together for you so that you can see it. There's a couple of additional slides in the back about, you know, a summary and the garage things I highlighted. Um, but we'll, we'll yeah. get you a PDF file. Okay. Great. Well, well thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Great. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks. you very much. Have a good day. Have a good day.